Creative Force Video Productions, the producer of PatientEducation.tv, is pleased to bring you Breath of Life, a caregiver's guide to home tracheostomy care. Be sure to visit our website at www.PatientEducation.tv for additional health-related topics delivered via the most current streaming video technologies. Hello, my name is Melanie Dragovitz, and I'd like to thank you for taking the time to view this presentation. I'd like to start by sharing a little personal information with you. My husband and I are the proud parents of two beautiful girls. Our youngest daughter, Elizabeth, was born with laryngeal malaysia, a condition that necessitated the surgical procedure known as a tracheostomy. When my husband and I first brought our daughter home from the hospital, we felt very afraid and alone, so I understand firsthand the range of emotions you're going through shock, anxiety, apprehension, but I want you to know you can handle it. With ample time and the proper education, trait care will become part of your normal daily routine. There are several different reasons a trait may be necessary, but the most common are genetic defect or accident. Regardless of why the trait is necessary, it is critical for parents to feel confident in their abilities to take care of their child. During the course of this program, you will learn how to suction, administer humidity and oxygen, change the trach ties, clean the stoma and change the gauze, change the trach, recognize symptoms of distress, and organize your travel kit. Rest assured that a trach will improve your child's quality of life as well as your own since it allows your baby to rest, get stronger, and provide a regular family schedule. So without further hesitation, let's begin. Suctioning is the one thing that you will probably be doing most frequently in your daily trach care routine. Let's start with looking at what equipment you will need to suction. Keep in mind that your medical equipment provider may have equipment that is essentially the same, but may look slightly different due to different manufacturers. Suction catheter kit. This will include at least one sterile glove, one sterile suction catheter, and usually some type of container to hold the HME while suctioning or to put saline in to clean the catheter. Sterile saline bullets. Ambu bag and oxygen should be within reach for emergencies or if your child needs oxygen as part of the instructions given by your doctor. Suction machine, stationary or mobile. If you can get one of both, it will be helpful to use the mobile suction machine in another area of the home. Extra trach, trach ties, and lubricant in case of emergency. Now we are ready to start the actual suction process. We are going to show you the sterile technique, which is how you will most likely be shown in the hospital. This technique minimizes the risk of bacteria or viruses being introduced into the trach tube, thereby helping to protect your child from respiratory infections. Although you will be using gloves, it is recommended you always wash your hands before and after suctioning your child. Before we show you an example of how to suction your child, we want to show you what you will actually be doing so that you can be confident that when you suction the right way, you are not hurting your child at all. If anything, you're providing them relief. It is always good to practice if you can so that you feel comfortable before doing the actual suctioning. The proper way to suction involves knowing how far down you need to insert the suction catheter. The easiest and safest way to do this is to measure your catheter tip against an extra trach tube that is the same size as your child's. 
The tip of the suction catheter should go to the end of the trach tube or just slightly past it, so if you can get an extra trach tube, try it. A lot of catheters have numbers on them, which will easily allow you to know where to stop. With our daughter's trach, I only need to go up to a 6 for a regular suction. I can go closer to 7 if I suspect a plug is forming and I need to go a little deeper, or if she's just a little extra gurgly. If your catheter does not have a number, you will have to eyeball about how far it should go. Okay, now let's begin. First, lay your child down on a clean surface. Then, open your suction catheter kit. Pick up the glove in the wrist area where it will have an inside out section. Slide the glove on your dominant hand being careful not to touch the exposed area of the glove. When you are first learning to suction, you may fumble with the glove but don't worry, you'll get better at it quickly. With the sterile glove, grab hold of the tip of the suction catheter. Twist the remainder of the catheter around your gloved hand. Your free hand can then bring the suction tubing to the end of the suction catheter and push it in. Turn the machine on with your clean hand. If your suction catheter has numbers on it, you can place your gloved thumb just above the measured number where you know you should stop. This way you know that you will not insert it too far. With your clean hand, hold your thumb over the hole at the end of the catheter. Do not press down on it yet. First, insert the catheter until you're at the desired length. Now, go ahead and press your thumb over the hole. Take a quick glance at the pressure readings. The needle should be between 80 to 100 millimeters for infants and 100 to 120 millimeters for children. Be sure that the needle is not above these set ranges as higher negative pressures have been shown to cause trauma. Slowly swirl around the catheter while drawing back slowly. The actual suctioning process is less than 10 seconds. Now stop and listen carefully. Do you still hear coarseness, or as we like to call it, gurglies? If yes, go ahead and pass the suction catheter down again. Usually two times is sufficient, but if the child is sick or is having an extra gurgly day, you may have to go down a third time. The goal is to allow the child to breathe freely and clearly. When suctioning, you should always take a quick glance at the mucus you are suctioning out. Although this sounds rather gross, you will get to know your child's mucus and you will be most able to judge when something has changed about it. By the way, don't be afraid to remind the doctors of this fact. You know when something is wrong and as your child's advocate, it is okay to insist. Ask yourself these questions. Is the mucus clear or white? If yes, that's good. That's the color you want to see. Is the mucus yellow or green? If yes, you may want to give a call to your child's doctor, especially if there's a foul odor coming from the trach. Please note that first thing in the morning mucus is often off color, so go ahead and wait a few hours to see if the mucus goes back to normal. Is the mucus very thin? You want the mucus to be thin, but if it seems very wet and thinner than usual, the child may be getting too much humidity. If this continues, you may want to consult your RT or doctor. Is the mucus very thick? Again, first thing in the morning you can expect some thickness, but if it continues it could mean your child is not getting enough humidity or it could be a sign of infection. Consult your doctor. If your child does have thick mucus in the morning or is experiencing a time when he or she has thicker mucus, you may benefit from introducing three to five drops of sterile saline from a saline bullet immediately before suctioning. It is not good practice to use saline every time you suction because you don't want to introduce too much fluid into the trach, which leads directly into the lungs. Just use it as needed and you should be fine. Additionally, the mucus may become thick due to dehydration. Make sure your child has plenty to drink every day so the secretions stay thin and do not block the trach tube. So now you know how to suction. I know the question we asked over and over after our daughter had her tracheostomy was, how often and how many times will I need to suction her? I got so frustrated when everyone gave me a generic answer like, you will just get to know your child. I did not understand that the seemingly generic answer was very true. When the child is gurgly, suction. You will soon start to notice what is normal for your child. 
Maybe your child will only need suctioning a few times a day, and maybe your child will be more like our daughter, the gurgly girl that she is, that needs it more like seven to 10 times a day. And if she's sick, or if it's an extra humid day, it's even more often. However, be careful not to over suction. A small amount of sound coming from the trach is normal. If it's mild and not causing your child distress, give him or her some time to try to cough it out. Over suctioning can result in overproduction of mucus, which can lead to an increased need for suctioning. Once you get to know your child's suctioning needs, it will be much easier to determine when an infection starts because you will notice that you need to suction more and the color and odor may change. It is important that you take the time after the tracheostomy while the child is still in the hospital to start to get to know what his or her suctioning routine will be like. Keep in mind that the time period after the tracheostomy will require more suctioning and if your child is a baby, he or she will most likely require more suctioning. If your child is going to have the trach for years, the child will eventually start to get strong enough to cough out secretions and will most likely not need suctioning as much. So get to know your child and you'll be a successful suctioner in no time. Since your child's air is entering through the trach and not their mouth or nose, they are bypassing the body's natural filtering and humidifying system. There are two main devices that have been designed to help compensate for this deficiency. The first is called a thermovent, also nicknamed a Swedish or artificial nose. This plastic barrel-shaped device slides onto the end of your child's trach. It has a filter on the end to prevent contaminants from entering your child's airway. The thermovent has two main designs, a single filter design for infants that shoots straight out from your child's trach and a double filter design that runs horizontally across your child's throat. Each nose is designed to both filter air and capture moisture from your child's breathing. This helps keep the throat warm and moist and helps prevent mucus plugs from forming. If the thermovent is too wet or your child has coughed up secretions into it, replace it with a new one. The thermovent is not designed for 24 hour a day use. It is designed primarily for daytime hours and should be replaced daily. The other device we will discuss is the air compressor. This mechanical device is typically used overnight or during naps and is designed to provide a continuous stream of cool moisture to keep your child's secretions thin and their trach plug free. The compressor nebulizes sterile water which then passes through aerosol tubing. The aerosol tubing runs to a mist collar also known as a trach mask and is placed over your child's trach. In the middle of the tubing there is a plastic bag that captures excess moisture that forms along the length of the tubing over time. The compressor delivers a continuous stream of moisture and can be adjusted for both air pressure and the amount of moisture desired. It is recommended that you change the sterile water every day and that you replace the aerosol tubing, trach mask, plastic bag, and sterile water container once a week to prevent bacteria buildup. If your child has been sick or if you feel it is appropriate, you can clean the trach mask more often using half-strength peroxide or vinegar water. While the air compressor does deliver a continuous stream of cool, moist, nebulized air to your child, it is not the best option since the solid water particles that make up the mist have the potential to spread infection. A better option, if available to you, is to use what is known as heated or active humidification. During heated humidification, shown here as part of a BiPAP system, Sterile water is held in a clear plastic container that is placed over a heating plate. When the water evaporates, the vapor is blown through the tubing toward your child's trach. The benefit of this system is that it more closely reflects the body's own humidifying system, plus water vapor is not capable of carrying the contaminant particle matter that a cool mist system can. In the event your child is not getting the proper amount of oxygen, an oxygen concentrator may be ordered by your physician. The concentrator will produce pressurized oxygen, which can then be delivered into the aerosol tubing via a plastic adapter. For Elizabeth, we supplement about 1.5 to 2 liters of oxygen when she needs it. You don't want to provide an excess amount of oxygen, just enough to keep her sats at the proper level. At first, the sound of the air compressor and oxygen concentrator may seem loud, and you will question whether or not you will be able to sleep with them running but in time, they will just seem like background noise and you will hardly be aware of them at all. By utilizing the air compressor, humidifier, and oxygen concentrator,
you will help improve your child's comfort, reduce the risk of infection, and minimize the amount of plugs that may form in the trach. It is very important to keep your child's neck clean and dry to reduce the risk of skin breakdown and infection. It is imperative that part of your daily routine includes changing the trach ties. We will show you how we change the ties with our particular two-piece type of tie. You may have a slight variation depending on what type the home care company provides you and how old your child is. Is your belly? It is suggested that you change the tie after bathing because trach ties will probably become wet during the bathing process. To make the trach tie process easier and quicker, have the supplies organized and ready. You will need a trach tie, 4x4 gauze, half-strength peroxide solution, and scissors. If you are working with an infant, you may find that using a shoulder roll will help give you best access during trach care. If you have the two-piece trach ties, you will have to size the trach tie by cutting off the excess. You can measure your child's neck with a measuring tape or by simply holding the trach tie around your child's neck and sizing it up. The proper fit should allow for one finger to fit between the neck and the trach tie. Having the tie too tight or too loose can cause serious problems. Once you get the right size, it is helpful to keep the piece you cut off so you can use it as a template when cutting your trach tie accurately every day. Now that your trach tie is cut and supplies are ready, it's time to change the trach tie. One of the most important things to keep your hand and eye on during the trach tie process is the trach itself so that it does not get a chance to slip out. First, pour some half-strength peroxide solution on two 4x4 gauze pads to dampen them. Then, place them on a clean, close-by surface along with the other supplies. Pick up your sized trach tie and place it near your child's head and have the Velcro strips detached from the cloth. Start to detach the existing trach tie on one side. Keep a finger or two on the trach the whole time. Wipe this side of the child's neck with one of the damp gauzes. Attach one side of the new trach tie to the trach. Now, gently slip the old trach tie behind your child's neck and then the new one behind the neck. Move your child's head to the other side and remove the old trach tie and wipe this side of the neck with the other damp gauze. Now you can attach the new trach tie and you're done! Most children get very used to this daily routine and will even work with you by moving his or her head as needed. What we just showed you is obviously the procedure when a child is lying down, but it could also be done if the child is sitting up, as long as you feel you have good control of the child not wiggling away. In order to reduce the risk of infection for your child, it is important that you clean the stoma and replace the gauze at least two to three times a day. At a minimum, we recommend that you change it first thing in the morning and again before bedtime. It is a good idea to make cleaning the stoma part of your changing the trach tie routine. Plus, if you notice any mucus around the trach area, or if you notice that the gauze is particularly wet at any time of the day, it is advisable to clean the area and replace the gauze at that time. Of course, if your child becomes ill, you may have to clean the stoma and change the gauze more like four to six times a day. The process is relatively easy. As with every method in this video, it is important to have all of your supplies within reach before starting. You'll need your half-strength peroxide, split gauze, two to four Q-tips, and a few four by four gauzes. First, remove the old split gauze gently and toss it in the garbage. Next, fold over your new cleaning gauze pad and dampen it with your half-strength peroxide solution.
Then wipe the area above and below the tray. And with a fresh damp cause, you may even wipe off the top of the trach. Next, dip a Q-tip into the half-strength peroxide solution and then gently clean around one side of the trach tube and stoma. Gently roll the Q-tip toward you to pull any loose mucus away from the stoma. Then, dispose of this Q-tip and dip a fresh one into the half-strength solution and repeat this step by cleaning from the stoma outward to the end of the trach on the other side. If the mucus is slightly hard, or if there is a large amount, you may need to use more than two Q-tips. It's not advisable to put a Q-tip that has mucus attached to it back toward the stoma to try and collect more. Simply toss that Q-tip out and get another one. Remember, they're only Q-tips. A clean stoma is much more important. Once you've finished cleaning the area, you should open your new split gauze pad. You can then slide one side of the gauze under the trach with a Q-tip and gently pull it up and then do the same on the other side. Keeping the trach, stoma, and neck of your child clean will help keep your child free of infection and odor and will also make them much more comfortable. Okay, here's the part of our video that every parent looks forward to the most. Well, not really, but it's something we really need to put a strong focus on anyway. Yes, it's time to change the trach. Before we show you this process, keep in mind that it is okay to be intimidated by it, especially the first few times you do it. You are dealing with your child's airway, so it is important to take it seriously. Keep in mind that this will not hurt your child and it will be over within seconds. The best way we can describe this process is that it is like changing an earring, but obviously this involves much greater risk. First off, it's important to get everything you'll need in one area so you can reach it easily. When performing a planned trach change, you should have two people present. If you have a home care nurse like we do, the nurse would be the best choice as your second person. The most important item you'll need is your new trach. For most infants, the trach package typically consists of only two pieces. The first object being the trach itself, and the second piece being a thin Q-tip shaped curved rod called an obturator. You will also need a water soluble lubricant, a new trach tie that has been measured and cut, a half strength peroxide solution, 4x4 gauze pads, and a fresh split gauze. It is also important to have an extra trach that is an X size down, oxygen, and a foam within reach in case of emergency. You should do your trach change at a time when your child is calm and happy, which will make the trachea more relaxed. However, don't be surprised if your child becomes a little agitated during the process. This is pretty normal. It's very important that you've washed your hands so they are free of dirt or germs. First, insert the obturator into the trach tube. Then, sparingly apply sterile lubricant to the end of the obturator. The obturator is designed to provide a smooth surface that helps guide the trach when it is being inserted. Remember, you should only ever hold the trach by the connector at the top of the neck plate to prevent contamination. Never touch the cannula directly. Now you should undo the Velcro straps from your child's existing trach. With your thumb and forefinger, Carefully remove the entire tube in a straight outward and downward motion. The trach should remove without too much effort. Don't be surprised if during the few seconds your child has a trach out, if he or she coughs mucus out of the stoma. This is normal. Instantly, insert the new trach using gentle pressure in a forward and downward movement. It is common to feel a minimal amount of resistance due to your child clamping down. 
If your child clamps down so hard that you cannot get the trach in, try again using the smaller trach. If that doesn't work, call 911 and follow your physician's specific instructions. Once the trach is in, you should quickly remove the obturator so that air can flow again. Next, insert the Velcro band of the trach tie through the loop on the trach's neck plate. Then slide the length of the tie behind your child's neck and fasten the remaining Velcro band through the loop on that side of the neck plate. Clean the stoma and surrounding area with your gauze, Q-tips, and half-strength peroxide solution. Once finished, you can clean the used trach with your half-strength peroxide solution and save it for future use. You should store it in a clean container with a lid. We saved our used trachs and provided them to family members and friends, so we had emergency trachs available at locations that we visited often. And that's all there is to it. I know it may seem stressful at first, but once you've done it a few times, your confidence will increase and it will not seem like so monumental a task. After all, if your child can handle it, then so can you. In the previous sections, we have shown you the ideal situations for proper trait care. However, each insurance provider has their own set policies on what specific supplies they will provide and the amount they will provide. It is up to you in your role as your child's advocate to take an aggressive stance in making sure that your insurance company provides you with the supplies you need. There will be times when your child may need more supplies than normal due to illness. Don't accept no as the final answer. If you need to get your doctors involved to write specific prescriptions, or you need to call multiple times each day till you get what you need, then do it. The squeaky wheel gets the oil. Your child is depending on you. The one thing parents worry about most regarding a trach is that it will become plugged and their child will be deprived of oxygen. Fortunately, there are warning signs that you can watch for. You hear a wheezing or whistling sound coming from the trach. Your child is breathing rapidly. Your child's nostrils flare with every breath. Your child looks frightened or anxious. Your child has difficulty swallowing or eating. Your child has a bluish tinge or dusky tone to their mouth, lips, or fingernails. Your child is restless. Your child has retractions. Retractions occur in the hollow of the neck, between the ribs, and under the breastbone, causing them to pull inward with each breath. If your child exhibits any of these signs, you should immediately suction the trach tube. If the signs continue, you should replace the trach tube and then try suctioning again. If these symptoms continue, even after changing the tube, you should call 911 immediately. Now that you're a pro at trach care, your next question might be, am I ever going to be able to leave my house with my trach child? If I do, what do I bring with me? The answer is yes, of course you can leave your house with your child, as long as there are no extenuating medical situations that would prevent you from doing this. It is important for children with special needs to still experience life, in safe environments, of course. It's a good idea to keep a travel bag with the following items. An extra trach, lubricant, an extra trach tie, split gauze, a few extra humid vents, a couple of Q-tips, an Ambu bag, saline bullets, several suction catheters, alcohol-based hand sanitizer, and any other supplies that are needed for your child. It is helpful to keep the trach supplies in a clear Ziploc bag so that if you need them quickly you can locate them. You will also probably have to carry a portable oxygen tank and portable suction machine. If your child is a baby, it will be helpful to bring a stroller with you that has a basket on the bottom to help store some of the supplies. Yes, you will get a bit of a workout lugging everything around, but you will figure out the best way for you and your family to still go out and enjoy life. In addition to what we've already discussed, 
there are a few other tips we wanted to provide that have helped us keep our daughter healthy. Wash your hands frequently, and especially before and after any type of trait care. Also, make sure your child's hands stay clean, as well as any other children in the household. Learn CPR and review the steps periodically to keep it fresh in your head. Keep some masks handy in case you or other caretakers get ill and need to do trait care while minimizing exposure to your germs. Pour about a cup of mouthwash in the suction canister in between weekly cleanings to help prevent malodorous bacteria growth. Is changing the trach ties every day a lot of work for you and your child? If so, you can have a gold or surgical steel chain custom made with large lobster claw clasps on each end so that it can stay on while you wipe your child's neck clean every day. Plus, some people like the way it looks. Always have half strength peroxide available and be sure to make a new solution of half water and half peroxide every three days. Also, the solution stays strongest when stored away from direct light. You may also use soap and water or a solution of one part white vinegar to two parts water as an alternative cleaning solution for the area around your child's stoma. It is also very important to have friends or family members who are going to take care of your child know how to maintain proper care. We suggest that you have them visit your house while a nurse or respiratory therapist is conducting a home visit. We would also recommend them watching this program. Be sure they have important emergency phone numbers. You should also contact your local fire department to make them aware that you have a special needs child. If EMS is needed, it helps for them to know ahead of time. Maintain a health care history for your child and have copies in an easy to find area in the event that you need to give it to a new health care provider. Well, we've arrived at the end of our program. For our closing note, we'd like to remind you that you should be sure to call your physician if you have any questions or concerns. Always err on the side of caution. In addition, be sure to contact your equipment provider if you have any questions regarding use, maintenance, or possible malfunction. We'd like to thank you for taking the time to view this presentation. We truly hope that it has provided you with the knowledge and confidence you'll need to properly take care of your son or daughter's trach. Be sure to visit our website located at www.patienteducation.tv for additional resources for tracheostomy care and education. Thank you and good luck.